Have you ever wondered how a country's overall economy functions? Now that's a question that can keep you awake at night. But fear not, we've got a field of study that tackles just that. It's called macroeconomics. Macroeconomics is like the helicopter view of the economy, looking at the big picture rather than individual pieces. Imagine you're up in the sky looking down at the whole economic landscape. That's the essence of macroeconomics. It's not just about money, it's about how societies use resources to fulfill their needs and wants. So why should you care about this big picture? Well, because it impacts your daily life in more ways than you might think. Whether you're buying a coffee, paying your rent, or planning for retirement, the forces of macroeconomics are at play. Let's take a closer look. Macroeconomics studies the behavior of the entire economy. That means everything from the inflation rate to unemployment, from economic growth to the effects of monetary and fiscal policy. When we talk about inflation, we're talking about the general increase in prices and fall in the purchasing value of money. If you've ever noticed that your favorite ice cream seems to cost more every year, inflation is the culprit. When we're discussing economic growth, we're looking at how the economy expands and produces more goods and services over time. If more people are finding jobs and businesses are booming, that's a sign of economic growth. Unemployment, on the other hand, is a measure of the number of people who are able and willing to work but can't find jobs. It's a key indicator of economic health, and when it's high, it's usually a sign of trouble. And finally, monetary and fiscal policies are the tools that governments and central banks use to steer the economy. They can tighten or loosen the reins, depending on what the economy needs. So, while it might seem like a complex subject, macroeconomics is really about understanding the big picture of how our economy works. It's about seeing the forest, not just the trees. So the next time you hear about the GDP or inflation rate on the news, remember that's macroeconomics at work. So what exactly is GDP and why does it matter to you? Well, GDP or gross domestic product is a term that's thrown around a lot when talking about the economy. But what is it really? In simple terms, GDP is the total value of all goods and services produced within a country's borders in a given period. This could be a year, a quarter, or even a month. It's like a snapshot of a country's economic activity. Now let's break that down a bit. When we say total value, we're not just talking about the final products that you and I buy in the shops. It includes every stage of production. For instance, the value of the wheat that's grown by the farmer, the flour that's produced by the mill, and the bread that's baked by the baker all contribute to the GDP. But why does GDP matter to you? Well, GDP is one of the primary indicators used to gauge the health of a country's economy. If the GDP is on the rise, the economy is in good shape. Businesses are producing, people are working, and incomes are likely growing. On the other hand, if the GDP is falling, it may signal that the economy is in trouble. Businesses might be producing less, people might be out of work, and incomes might be stagnant or falling. This is why economists, policymakers, and even ordinary people like you and me keep a close eye on the GDP. It helps us understand whether our economy is growing, shrinking, or just staying the same, and that impacts everything from the job market to our personal finances. So, next time you hear someone talking about the GDP, you'll know what they're on about. It's not just some abstract concept, it's a vital tool that helps us understand the health and direction of our economy. In essence, a growing GDP signals a healthy economy while a shrinking GDP might indicate problems. Why does a bag of chips cost more than it did five years ago? It's a question that's crossed our minds at some point. The answer to that lies in the intriguing concepts of inflation and deflation. Inflation is like a stealthy thief, sneaking into our wallets and making our money worth a little less each year. It's the rate at which the general level of prices for goods and services is rising. So that bag of chips that was a dollar five years ago might now be a dollar and 25 cents. But wait, it's not all doom and gloom. Moderate inflation is actually a sign of a healthy, growing economy. It means that consumers are buying, businesses are selling, and the wheels of the economy are turning. So what about deflation? Well, deflation is the opposite of inflation. It's when the general level of prices are falling. Sounds great, right? You'd be able to buy more bags of chips for your dollar. But hold on, too much of a good thing can be bad. Excessive deflation can lead to what economists call a deflationary spiral. This is when falling prices lead to lower production, which in turn leads to lower wages and demand, which again leads to falling prices. It's a vicious cycle that can cripple an economy, and it's exactly what happened during the Great Depression. Both inflation and deflation impact our purchasing power. With inflation, 
Each dollar you have buys a smaller percentage of a good or a service. With deflation, it's the other way around. Each dollar you have buys a larger percentage of a good or a service. But here's the thing. Neither rampant inflation nor excessive deflation is good for an economy. It's all about finding that sweet spot, a balance, where the economy can grow without the value of money swinging wildly. So, inflation and deflation are like the economic version of a seesaw. It's all about balance. Why does the government care so much about the unemployment rate, you might wonder? Well, it's because unemployment is more than just a number, it's a silent economic indicator that reveals the health of a nation's economy. First, let's grasp the concept of unemployment. Simply put, it refers to the situation where individuals who are capable of working and actively seeking work are unable to find jobs. It's not about people who are retired, studying, or willingly not working, it's about those who want to work but can't find employment. Unemployment can be categorized into three types, frictional, structural, and cyclical. Frictional unemployment is a natural occurrence in any economy. It happens when workers are transitioning between jobs, perhaps due to personal reasons or relocation. Then we have structural unemployment which arises from a mismatch between the skills workers possess and the skills demanded by employers. Think of it as trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. If the job market needs data analysts but you're an expert in medieval literature, you might find yourself structurally unemployed. Lastly, there's cyclical unemployment which is tied to the economic cycle. During a recession, businesses tend to cut back, leading to job losses. Conversely, in an economic boom, employment rates typically increase. Now, why is the unemployment rate such a crucial economic indicator? It's because high unemployment rates often signal an underperforming economy. If a lot of people are unemployed it means less spending, which can lead to slower economic growth. On the other hand, very low unemployment might signal an overheated economy, potentially leading to inflation. Moreover, the unemployment rate affects everyone, even those who are employed. High unemployment can lead to lower wages and job insecurity, while low unemployment can lead to wage inflation and increased job security. So next time you hear about the unemployment rate, remember it's not just about numbers on a screen. It's about real people seeking work, the skills they bring, and the economic conditions they face. Remember, unemployment isn't just statistics. It's about real people and their livelihoods. Ever wondered who's at the helm of a country's economy and how they steer it? Just like a ship's captain, governments and central banks use two primary tools, known as fiscal and monetary policies, to chart the course of an economy. Let's first talk about fiscal policy. This is the government's way of managing the economy by adjusting its spending and tax rates. When the economy is sluggish, the government might increase spending or cut taxes to stimulate growth. This is known as expansionary fiscal policy. On the other hand, when the economy is overheating, it could reduce spending or raise taxes to cool things down, a strategy known as contractionary fiscal policy. Now let's shift gears to monetary policy, which is controlled by a nation's central bank. Monetary policy involves managing the supply of money and interest rates to control inflation and stabilize the economy. When the economy needs a boost, the central bank might lower interest rates to encourage borrowing and spending, a strategy known as expansionary monetary policy. Conversely, when the economy is too hot, the central bank might raise interest rates to slow borrowing and spending a tactic called contractionary monetary policy. Both fiscal and monetary policies aim to achieve economic goals such as stable prices, full employment, and sustainable economic growth. They're like the steering wheel and rudder of a ship, guiding it through the choppy waters of economic cycles. But remember, just like navigating a ship, steering an economy is not an exact science. It requires a delicate balance and constant adjustments. Governments and central banks must carefully monitor economic indicators and make informed decisions to keep the economy on course. So, fiscal and monetary policies are the rudders that guide the economic ship, helping it navigate through the turbulent waters of the global economy. Whether it's a calm sea or a stormy weather, these policies ensure that our economic ship sails smoothly towards its destination. We've covered a lot today, haven't we? We started with the big picture of macroeconomics, understanding its broad strokes and high-level concepts. From there, we dove into the depths of gross domestic product, or GDP, exploring how it serves as a vital indicator of a nation's economic health. We then unraveled the mystery of inflation and deflation, two economic phenomena that have significant impacts on our everyday lives. We learned how they affect the purchasing power of our hard-earned money and the overall economy. 
Our journey continued as we shed light on unemployment, the silent economic indicator that speaks volumes about the state of the job market and the economy as a whole. Finally, we navigated the complex world of fiscal and monetary policies, the economy's steering wheel. We discovered how these policies guide our economic journey, influencing everything from our personal finances to the global economy. Remember, understanding macroeconomics helps us make sense of the world around us. So, keep questioning, keep learning, and keep growing. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and comment. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to keep up with the latest content.